So hopefully that gives you some, some way to navigate these, con these conceptual terms before we move forward. Now, I wanted to share some, some thoughts about the, the uh, North American context. Um, my own research, as I mentioned, has, you know, I, I have a, uh, written a book on, on the history and philosophy of Islamic schooling in North America. And I'll just give you a very sort of broad brush um, of some of the, of the historical trajectory of Islamic schooling in North America. And then I'll speak a little bit about the distinctions of the types of schools that um, will hopefully give you some, some, um, some nuance to, uh, uh, to what's distinct in the North American context. So in terms of the historical trajectory, um, I would say that Islamic schools in North America must be, must, the, the historical um, narrative must begin with the nation of Islam, who many would consider being outside of the fold of, of sort of um, mainstream uh, Muslim belief and practice. Um, but it's an important history because in the 1930s, um, with the establishment of the nation of Islam uh, through, through Elijah Muhammad, and then most notably expanded through, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the voice and efforts of, of Malcolm X, um, and then later transitioned um, among sort of Sunni Muslim, mainstream Muslim uh, discourse, through the efforts of, of, of Warth Dean Muhammad, uh, the son of Elijah Muhammad, really was the beginning of the earliest Islamic schools in North America, in, in the United States in particular. And these schools were established, what I call through a, an, um, a, a sentiment of protest. And what I mean by that is, is, is for black Americans um, in the United States in that time of the 1930s, it wasn't really a choice um, to say that we, you know, we want to send our children to mainstream public or state schools. Um, the quality of education, the, 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 the um, you know, the, uh, the acceptance um, of, of black Americans at the time um, was, was highly uh, problematic. Um, there was high levels of significant amounts of racism and, and discrimination, um, and, and this came out in the educational process. So the Nation of Islam took it upon themselves to establish schools to reinforce faith, understanding, but also to give young black Americans a sense of confidence in who they are and, and to appreciate um, themselves as human beings and as contributors to society. So. It was, it was a form of protest establishing these schools because they weren't allowed to technically establish their own schools and homes at the time. Um, but they did so because of the, the strong belief they had about um, the educational process. Now, for many, for many communities in the, in the United States, this history is, is forgotten. And I've written about it extensively, largely because I think it's an important trajectory between um, between the earliest schools that then transition and still continue to today, known as the Sister Clara Muhammad schools, uh, after um, after the mother of of, of, of Imam Warth Dean Muhammad, uh, named after her, um, who was really the first teacher of these schools, um, and these schools transitioned, as I mentioned, in the 1970s and 80s, into becoming from Nation of Islam schools to mainstream. Uh, my, mainstream Muslim or Islamic schools. Um, but that then also led to a transition between uh, what, what's known as sort of the indigenous community, the indigenous being the indigenous African American Muslims who, who were in the United States um, during the slave trade, prior to the slave trade, um, and, and had a presence in the American uh, social fabric. Um, but in the 1960s and 1970s, a very significant influx of immigrants, Muslims, from across South Asia and the Middle East and other parts of Muslim-majority countries came to America as well, um, largely as graduate students um, and as, as working professionals who came to America to get settled. And, and when they came at this time, um, 
they came to really understand that they needed to preserve their identity. So it took us into a trajectory of preservation where they recognize that um, preservation of identity of their faith identity was really important, both their cultural identity, but more so of their faith identity. For many of them, they almost, you know, shed their, I wouldn't say shed, but they would, they, 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 they set aside their cultural identities of whether they came from Lebanon or Egypt or Pakistan or India or, you know, Algeria, uh, Sudan, they put aside their cultural identity for the sake of their religious identities and established first weekend schools and then later full-time uh, full day Islamic schools as a way of preserving their identity. The reason why this stage is also very important is because at this stage, trying to establish schools was more about establishing places of learning that were, um, that were, would be recognized at a state and national level uh, for providing an education that was equivalent to state, uh, state and national standards of education. So it was almost more important in these early stages of preservation, this was around the 1970s and 80s, to ensure that the schools that were being established, um, the schools that were being established would be, um, uh, would be recognized. They're, they had to have a, a curriculum, uh, a school context, make sure that they followed policy and regulation around educational policy and regulation. And religious studies as a result sort of became, um, became a subset. Religious studies became a subject within the broader expanse of, of curriculum that was being adopted in these schools. So there was such a push in these early schools, early Islamic schools in the 1980s and, and then into the 90s, to just show that they were, they were following, complying with national educational standards, that to an extent, um, Islamic studies became one subject area, as well as sort of weave throughout the school, you know, ethos. But, but the subject itself became uh, a one-off subject. And then that led us into the third phase, and this took us into the 1990s and into the 2000s, where Muslim educators started saying to themselves, hold on, we've established these Islamic schools, um, you know, to preserve our children's identity. But really, when you just look at them without, in, with the exception of this one-off Islamic studies course, there really isn't enough about Islam that is, that is permeating our school context. So the concept of pedagogy started to become more, more sort of central in conversations about amongst educators in the 1990s and 2000s, where they started saying, we need to start thinking about how do we weave, you know, Islam, Islamic values and perspectives across the curriculum? Um, and how do we begin to take Islam more seriously as part of our Islamic ethos of the school and not just an add on to the curriculum? So people started criticizing, a lot of educators and academics started criticizing sort of the add and stir approach of, you know, we, we're just trying to add Islam to an existing curriculum, but we need to really rethink um, what it means to, to provide a holistic education um, in the Islamic tradition. So these, again, were conversations. A lot of initiatives around integrated curriculum started to become established at this time. and. Um, and, and, and that led to a lot of educational thought that probably, you know, the, 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 in the time of protest, it was more about just getting the schools established and, 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 and preserving our, and, and, and protecting our identity. In the preservation stage, it was about just establishing the buildings and getting the school and complying with, with regulation. In the pedagogy phase, it started to become, it, it started to focus on the actual educational thought uh, and curriculum initiatives began to blossom at the time. And then came the, the, the stage of praxis. And what I mean by praxis is really a, a deepening of, of thought about what it means to be Muslim. There was one Muslim uh, uh, academic and, and educator who was quite, quite, uh, quite uh, prolific in, his, in his, you know, um, his push for thinking about what Islamic schools are really about. And he said that, you know, Islamic schools are not, not just about imparting content, but we need to start asking ourselves what it means to be Muslim. 